Let's uh, turn this moment into a time of prayer, church. Father, we, uh, we come before you in this moment. Even as we've gone through activities to get us to this point in the day, we come together as a people and we say, in the midst of a world of unfaithfulness, we stop and we remember that you are faithful. And in a world that keeps us busy, our minds racing, anxiety flooding us, fear and concern for how things are going to go, uh, Father, we come and we worship you as the faithful one, and we come before you as dependent, needy children. We need you to calm us. We need you to comfort us. We need you to strengthen us. We need your encouragement, and we need your support. And we know that in our big brother, King Jesus, we have all of those things. And in the great helper, the mighty counselor, the Holy Spirit. We have one who walked with Jesus and also dwells in us so that the love and life of Jesus can reside in us and flow through us. Father, the world and this whole life is too much for us, but it is not too much for you. And we come before you with whatever this week has been, and we say thank you for your faithfulness, Thank you for your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we're coming again like needy children, like we just need a little bit more help, Father. We need you to guide us, help us to listen. As we open up your word this morning, I pray that you would teach us what we need to be taught. That you would bring clarity and conviction where we need it. And Father, most importantly, that you would undergird us with your encouragement, the encouragement of other believers that not one of us walks alone in this life. Father, I give you thanks for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, unless you just want to stand up with me. Um, you can get your Bible. You can put it on your lap and get ready. If you're going to take some notes, today's a good day to do that. Um, if you're a guest with us, we're glad that you're here. Welcome to First McAllen, First Baptist Church. We've been here since 1908, if you've never heard of us before. Um, we've been around for a while, and we're a church that believes there's hope and healing in one name, and that name is? Jesus. Oh, that's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, so we believe that as we abide in Christ, as we build healthy relationships, uh, and as we care for our community, that's what's going to help us be disciples of Jesus that will help make disciples. And we've been in, uh, from the beginning of the year, we've gone through this idea of how do we multiply being disciples who make disciples? This is what Jesus charged us and commissioned us to do. And so we've taken time to think about what is a disciple? Uh, what does it mean to actually follow after Jesus? We've looked at what is the church, local, global, like what is this thing? And we've taken some other big steps and then we got into the Old Testament. I'm like in day 497 of my Old Testament reading for the year. Sometimes it feels like you're just dragging through there. Get a little sprinkling of psalms in there, and I'm just like, give me Jesus, please. So as we've walked through this, we started in Genesis 1, and we said that God is creator, and that he created all things. And he said that they were good, and then he creates man, and he breathes life into Adam. And then he takes a rib from his side, and he creates a helper to come alongside him, and Eve. And so in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, we've got God creating everything. He creates the first human beings, and he says, oh, this is very good. It was not good if man was going to be alone, so he needed a helper. And then he gives them basically one rule, man. Be in relationship with me, enjoy the garden, but stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You've got a choice to either worship me and obey me or disobey. And that one comes with consequences. The serpent enters in, tempts Eve with Adam at her side. And they, they said, the serpent says, did God really say? So the enemy didn't attack with all kinds of other shiny objects. The enemy attacked on the authority of God's word. It says, do you really believe God is who he says he is and that you have to listen to what he said? And that little bit of doubt twists a little bit. And we know the story. Eve takes a bite, hands it to her husband, Adam, who was right there. And he takes a bite. And then they realize they are not clothed. They grab some fig leaves and make themselves some garments. 
they couldn't go and get a print and have a sewing machine. I don't even know how they got that together, but they did. They tried. Human ingenuity. Then they go and they hide. In a normal occasion when the Spirit of the Lord was walking through the garden, rather than embracing their Creator, they hide from Him. And they cover themselves up. And Adam is like, where are you? And they're like, oh, we're over here. God knew where they were the whole time. We didn't want to show up because we were uncovered. Who told you you were uncovered? And then here it goes. Genesis 3 gives us that story that eventually leads to an eviction out of the garden. God provides for Adam and Eve a covering more suitable. It's a skin of an animal that then covers their unclothedness, and then they are removed from God's presence in the garden. They're removed from the tree of life. They are removed from all of that, and thus begins humanity with inherited sin after the original sin and then the Old Testament gets even wilder. And so we've gone through these moments. Abraham has a son Isaac who has Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons. And one of them has a really fancy coat that his daddy gave him. And his brothers are jealous. And so they decide they're going to kill him. And then they decide maybe we won't kill him. And they throw him in a pit. And then they sell him as a slave. And he ends up in Egypt. And he goes through some things. I know you're having a week. But Joseph had some major issues going on in his life. All kinds of reasons, but God works together. and God puts him in a unique position. His brothers end up coming back, and he's able to take care of his people. And then the people of Israel end up in Egypt. And then a Pharaoh comes along that doesn't remember Joseph and his God. And so they all become enslaved. And so then God raises up this little guy who his first trip was in a little basket down the river. Because the Pharaoh was psychotic and was going to try to kill all the firstborn males because he heard a rumor. And so Moses' mother puts him in a little basket, sends him down the river. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, calls a Hebrew woman to come and nurse him. Turns out it's Moses' mama. Even in the midst of drama and tragedy, God is still doing good things. So this guy Moses, who's an Israelite, he's raised up of all the things of Egypt. And then he gets into an altercation because he sees some of his people, the Hebrew people, being abused. And he steps in, and he oversteps, and he actually commits murder. And then he flees out of there. He gets as far away from Egypt as he possibly can. It's really not that far. And he gets out of there. And then he's minding his own business, staying out of the limelight, avoiding the paparazzi, just hiding away. And then this unconsumed burning bush calls him by name you ever had a weird moment you ain't had that moment I've hidden in bushes before and waited for people to walk by and call them by name that's a weird moment pretty entertaining but this is epic moment this God who has been working the Creator has been working and now he's got Moses out on a mountain he shows up in a burning bush that's not being consumed calls him by name and he says hey buddy I know you're familiar with Egypt and I'm sending you back I'm not going back I kind of had an issue last time I was there and he's like no you're gonna go and he's like but I don't speak real well he's like well take Aaron he can speak pretty good y'all go well if I go who do I tell him sent me because I'm not just showing up that's weird he's like no you tell him I am sent me I am what I am it as our teenagers would say he him that he is it. He is the creator God of all things. He's the one that's sending you. And so Moses eventually goes, and then Pharaoh doesn't listen, and then there's the ten plagues. Bop, 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 bop. Finally, after all of this chaos, and even after death, the firstborn of every household, unless they have the blood of a spotless lamb over the doorpost as a covering, they are not saved. But anyone who does take the blood of the spotless lamb and put it on the doorpost and passes underneath that threshold, they're covered. And in Egypt, there was horrific death. Pharaoh finally says, that's it, get out. And so they go, about a million people with a leader who didn't really want to be the leader. And then they end up at the Red Sea. Great, now it's over. The army's coming. God splits the Red Sea. They walk through as on dry land. 
The army gets into the water, six flags, I mean, sea world, there it is, all the water above them, and then God just closes it. Army gone. And then they get to this moment where they're at Mount Sinai, where Moses had been before, and we've looked at it where God has all of the people surrounding the mountain, He's coming down on this thick, dense cloud, and there's lightning, and there's thunder, and I picture the flames coming from inside of this. This is not a burning bush moment. This is like the whole mountain is being consumed. And the people are all there, and the, the earth quakes, and Moses goes up into this dick, uh, thick, dense cloud. He gets up in there, and he's there meeting with God, and God gives them the Ten Commandments. And he says, no other gods beside me. I'm it. I'm still I am. I am the only one. So don't make any images that are a poor representation of who I am. And then when you think about me and you say my name, you pay attention to my words. You use your words wisely. When you talk about me, you define my true character. You represent me properly. And guess what? Just like I took a Sabbath rest on that seventh day of creation, you remember to take a Sabbath rest and remember that I am holy. You pause all of it to remember who I am. And then you know what? You're going to honor your father and mother. You're going to honor the generations before you. You're going to make sure that you represent me well to the generations that come before you. And then you shall not murder. You're not going to take life. This is not what you're to do. I'm the life giver. You be a life giver as well. And he's like, and when it comes to marriage between that sacred union, you make sure that you don't lie with somebody else, that you respect your marriage and other people's marriages, you shall not commit adultery. And then he gets to number eight, and he says, you shall not steal. Otherwise, you're going to end up behind bars. He's like, you do not steal. You have what you have, you care for what you have, and you make sure you respect everybody else's stuff as well. And then he says, do not bear false witness against somebody. Don't tell people that this is four and that this is five. You be honest and truthful. You make sure you care for the reputation of other people. When you think about the third commandment, what do we say about who God is? We got to make sure that we represent other people well as well. And then don't covet. Don't take your hands and try to grab everybody else's stuff and put it into your heart. Watch out for envy and jealousy. And just remember, this is, these are the markers. These are the things that are going to help you remember who I am and how do you interact with everybody else. And so this begins to take place. And then we get to today. And I've got to talk to you this morning about sacrifice and atonement. You ready? I don't have any animals. I'm not going to do any of that. If you have ever read the Old Testament, you're going to see what is a, in my opinion, it's gross. I'm not like a big blood guy. Like, I do the hunting, and I've done that kind of stuff, but I'm like, I'm just not like waking up on a Saturday morning when it's freezing outside and go like, man, I can't wait to go gut a deer. Like, I know some of you are, and that's great. Enjoy yourself. Uh, bring the backstrap. But for me, it always makes me kind of like queasy, and I'm like, golly. And there's this sacrificial system in the Old Testament, and there's this idea of atonement all the way back into Genesis 3, and then there's this whole system that's built. So we're going to talk about atonement. You ready? Deep breath. If you will hang with me to the very end, we might really simplify this for you. I'll use a lot of words, and then we might just, you'll say, you should have just done that first, Pastor. We got out early last week, Pastor. I'm taking my minutes back today, okay? According, according to Franklin uh, Ollie, in the New Testament, There are 290 references to the love of God. 290. 290 times when God has declared his love for humanity. That's a lot, 290. But in the same chapters, same verses, there's more than 1,300 references to the atonement. Have you talked about the atonement this week? Probably not. 1,300 assurances that salvation can be had through blood, and specifically the blood of Christ. So what is atonement? That's our first big question. Our first big question, what is atonement? So the Bible teaches that sin is a separator. It separates us from God. It creates a need for reconciliation. If you take something that was together, and then it's torn apart, 
Reconciliation is the process of putting it back together. We were created by God in His image for His purposes. Sin has ripped that apart. And in Jesus Christ, because of His atonement, God can put it back together again. In the Old Testament, there's animal sacrifices. They're offered so many different ways. They're always for the payment of what has happened in the past. In the Old Testament, anytime there's a sacrifice, it's for what has already happened. It's the, my bad, here's the blood sacrifice to cover what we did. Over and over and over and over again. It was never something that was going to cover all of sin. The sacrificial system is an ongoing, repetitive atonement. So atonement means making amends, reparation or satisfaction for wrongdoing. Let me give you a practical example that happened yesterday. Um, so one of our vehicles um, was parked outside, and somebody else backed really fast out of their driveway and just smashed it, um, and then drove off. Kristen comes out from what she was doing, and she's like, Stephen, has there always been like a mega dent back here? And I was like, show me a picture. And I'm like, no. And so all of a sudden it was like, oh, what do we do? Who's got ring cameras at the neighborhood? And then they discovered that a police report had already been made. The person that had hit it didn't know which house to go to. And all that's going to be fine. But there has to be an atonement. There have to be reparations. Because uh, Emma will be very upset if it doesn't get fixed. Right, so this realization, they're like, there was damage done, and there needs to be atonement, reparation, it's got to be taken care of, okay? So just kind of keep that idea that once the atonement happens, then the car is like, ah, back to where it was before. This idea. So let's walk through this. Uh, atonement is the process of making amends. It's what has to happen, and biblically it involves making up for sins, errors, offenses, especially through some form of sacrifice or penance. This is not something that we're real familiar with. You did not this weekend go down to the flea market and go, I've got to have a spotless lamb today. We are not going to church without a spotless lamb. We took doves last time. That was embarrassing. Okay? We're not doing that again. We don't have in the connection center where you can buy a sacrifice. Like it's not, we don't, it's not what we do. But in the Old Testament, there was a whole system and process. So let's talk about this. Why is atonement necessary? We've talked about this a little bit. Atonement is necessary because God is creator, God is holy, and humanity is sinful. This is flat out the truth that the scriptures teach. So God's holy, God's justice requires payment for sin. God's wrath is required to act against sin. This is part of it. When someone wrongs you, you want it to be handled justly and fairly. When you wrong somebody else, you want mercy. God is holy, so he is righteous, always does the right thing. So whatever he requires, it is the right and appropriate requirement. Even if it makes us wrestle and we, we don't feel great about it, it's still the truth. Wayne Grudem says this idea of what sin does to humanity as we deserve to die as the penalty of sin. Thanks for the encouragement, Pastor. We deserve to bear God's wrath against sin. We are separated from God by our sins, and we are in bondage to sin and to the deceit of the enemy. Why is atonement necessary? Because we're in a jam we can't get ourselves out of. And what we deserve what we have coming to us, what our sins have earned, it puts us on the wrong side of God's wrath. But the good news is, biblically, Jesus stands in the gap. And he's already taken care of a lot of this. And we'll look at that in just a moment. So, what is atonement? Why do we need atonement? How is atonement paid? Good news is, uh, we can look back on the New Testament and go, oh, it has been paid. But let's take a quick little glance at the Old Testament. So atonement requires blood because blood signifies life. Uh, even all the way back into Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, they realize they're uncovered and that guilt and that shame is on them. They feel that. It immediately changes their relationship with God. They hide themselves. And then they try to create a covering. I mean, Genesis 3 lays it out. They try to create a covering and it doesn't work. 
And so God provides one. It's the first reference towards the shedding of blood in the, New, in the Old Testament. That the skin of an animal was presented. He didn't just have a little rug lying around. It is the idea that because of sin, life was lost, blood was shed, so that humanity could be covered. Leviticus 17, 11. You didn't think you were going to hear about Leviticus this morning, did you? All right. Some of you were like, I've been waiting for years. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have appointed it to you to make atonement on the altar for your lives, since it is the lifeblood that makes atonement. This idea of lifeblood, making that atonement, to cover that sin. Then you jump into the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no forgiveness of sin. There's no covering over sin. So atonement payments were made by animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. This is how they were made. So in the Old Testament sacrificial system instituted by God to deal with the people's sins. They had to have a spotless lamb without blemish. If they didn't have one, if they couldn't afford it, there was a whole system so that everybody could bring some sort of sacrifice. You would have the priest, and the priests were responsible to represent the people to God and represent God to the people. The priests had to make sacrifices for their own sins so that they would be covered. And then they would make sacrifices for the other people, the entire nation. And then there was even a day of atonement. This was a big one. And in my words, it would have been, for me, like a bloody, gross mess of an experience. I would have not enjoyed it. But for the, all of the people knowing that this is a day that God is going to atone and cover all of our sins, and we're going to make these sacrifices, the people of Israel would have understood a blood sacrifice. Not something we talk a lot about. But this idea that this would take place. But what was wild is it was perpetual. It was never ending. Again and again and again and again. And once the temple's there, and then the Holy of Holies, the big thick curtain, and the priest would go in. It's really interesting because the priest and his garments would have bells at the bottom. And they would tie a rope to one of his legs. So when that priest went in before the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood on the altar for the people, if he was not cleansed of his sin, and if the Lord struck him dead, and the bells stopped ringing, they would know, let's drag him out. Read the Bible, kids. Yeah. And so when the New Testament talks about that we have one high priest who went in himself and by his own blood made that sacrifice for sins that we would be covered, it takes that Old Testament sacrificial system that was bloody and ongoing and could only take care of what had already happened and would have to be done over and over and over again. And Jesus fulfills it. And he becomes the spotless lamb that takes away the sins of the world. By his wounds we are healed. In Christ we have forgiveness of sins. So there's all types of things that you can study and read about in the Old Testament. But the priests would go in, they'd offer those sacrifices, and judicially the penalty would be done. You no longer owe this penalty. And then the clock starts again, adding it all back up again. Over and over again. When you read the Old Testament, when you think about the sacrificial system, as you learn about all of that, just know it's a shadow. It's a shadow of what Christ is going to come and do and fulfill. When we read, and a lot of times at Easter, it is finished, what that means is, is that on the cross, Jesus Christ paid that sacrifice by his blood, and that whenever we are covered by Jesus, when we come under the cross, then we are covered. And that old system goes away, and now we go to Jesus and Jesus alone. He made the ultimate sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 4. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So even in the Old Testament, whenever they're going through these processes, it's all really falling short and pointing toward a greater sacrifice to come. Take a deep breath. You still with me? Okay. 
So atonement paid in full by Jesus in the New Testament fulfills that sacrificial system of the Old Testament. When you read the Old Testament, also read Hebrews. Hebrews is like taking the fill in the blanks and putting it over the Old Testament sacrificial system and going like, oh, here's how this all works in Jesus. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come in the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The other priest, over and over and over and over again, hey, what are you going to do today? Well, it's the Day of Atonement. We know what we're doing. Over and over and over, Jesus did it once, paid in full, got the receipt, left the tomb. We look to Jesus as our ultimate chief uh, high priest, and we go to him for that atonement. When we need covering for our sin, we don't sow our own fig leaves. We don't go and find some sort of religious practices to cover it up. We say, here I am. I need Jesus. You cover me. And Jesus is our advocate. He stands before us. Trust me, that is way better than the Old Testament sacrificial system and having to live that out. Adrian Rogers, if you don't know Adrian Rogers, um, he's a statesman of a pastor. Uh, he's in glory these days. And uh, he's known for his booming voice and leading the conservative resurgence uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention. And man, he's just a phenomenal preacher. Some people said that Adrian Rogers could lead people to Christ if he read a menu at a restaurant because he had just such a unique voice. And so he's got a little book called The Scarlet Thread Through the Bible. When you think about your Bible and you start with Genesis 1, if you track it, you can follow this scarlet thread all throughout all, all of these stories in the Scriptures. And you can take it all the way to Jesus. And you can see how Jesus, all of this foreshadowing is happening, all of these concepts and ideas. And so I want to give you a few points out of his book, The Scarlet Thread, through the Bible when it comes to Jesus and the atonement. You're going to know more about the atonement than you wanted to know today. You might forget more about the atonement than you've ever forgotten before. But we're giving it a shot. One, his blood redeems us to purchase, to buy back. There was a price we could not pay, but the blood of Jesus redeemed us. First Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that, the, that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless Lamb, when we talk about blood in church, there's churches that won't do it. They won't talk about it. And I get it. I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm not like jumping up and down to like, let's talk about blood. It just, bleh. but we can, you cannot read the scriptures and read about Jesus and understand the gospel and just decide to remove the things that make us feel uncomfortable. The whole point is to be in our sin is more uncomfortable than to face truth from God's word and then to respond to it. So his blood redeems us. The second thing he says is his blood brings us into fellowship with God. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Again, this reference, we're brought near to God by the blood of Christ. Without the blood of Christ, man is still far from God. Number three, his blood makes peace with God. His blood makes peace with God. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, that's Jesus, and through him, that's Jesus, to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Again, this reference to the shedding of blood, the blood of Christ making peace with God. Number four, his blood cleanses. I don't think about blood as a cleanser. I've never spilt something on my white shirt 
And no one has ever said, oh, we'll just rub some blood on it. It's not what that means. But it's this spiritual cleanser. His blood cleanses. 1 John 1, 7 through 10. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But it says that his blood cleanses us from our sins. And then the fifth one, his blood gives us power over the devil. Interesting statement, interesting phrase, that his blood gives us power over the devil. Revelation 12, 11. They conquered him, speaking of the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. It says that they actually conquered by the blood of the lamb. They were covered and they were empowered to go against the enemy because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Atonement. You see it all throughout the scriptures. You can go do a deep dive, but atonement is this idea of becoming at one with God. At one in the moment of receiving Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us to be covered by what Christ has done. Now, I've told you, I don't really enjoy the whole blood scene. But do you know that if one of my children, if my wife, if somebody I care and love about, if they are injured and there is a loss of blood, first, I know you react and you respond and you want to try to do what? Stop the bleeding. And then you want to get somebody who can come in and really fix the issue. But as human beings, blood is what flows through us to keep us alive. At the very center and core of who we are, that little heart pumping away. And that little heart, when there's a problem, if there's an opening somewhere in us, that heart keeps doing its job, but there's a leak. And that needs to be closed up. And then at times, if we lose too much blood, we need to have what? We need to have a transfusion. And I don't know about you, but I don't have like bags of my own blood just hanging around. If you do, I'm just saying it's pretty clear, creepy. Um, but maybe there's a medical reason. So what do we have? We have people that will consistently become what? Blood donors. Because they know that in blood you have what? Life. And without blood you have what? Death. And so to be a blood donor, you have to give up some of your very life, some of this blood. And the human body designed by God, like the way it just works and creates blood and all that stuff, that's way beyond my fifth grade paying attention in school, uh, science brain. But I'm just telling you, we, we're familiar with blood. We're familiar with life and when we need it. And what the Bible teaches is that blood is necessary for our very forgiveness, for our very own spiritual life, and that Jesus was the ultimate blood donor for us. That he was willing to sacrifice his own life, to shed his own blood, so that we might have a transfusion spiritually, so that we, though we were dead in our trespasses and lost in our sin, and we were lifeless, that we could become a new creation because the blood of Christ would be infused into us, and it could bring new life to us. And it's not only just us trying to be better, it's the very life of Jesus flowing in us so that we can live out the fruit of the Spirit, so that we can be representatives of Jesus everywhere that we go, so that the broken places that sin has ravaged in our own lives and in our families can experience some hope and some healing because there is a blood that is not our own flowing through us that gives us a life that was not our own, but because he was willing to lay down his life, we can now have his life in us. 
So we can't be afraid of the blood. It's okay to enter in and talk about it. It's a precious thing. So how is atonement applied? Atonement is applied through the faith in Jesus Christ. By trusting in what he has done for us. Atonement is applied when a person admits their sins to God, when they believe in Jesus' sacrificial work, and just confess their need to have him as a Savior. To admit, my sin separates me, I'm lifeless. I'm bleeding out spiritually, if you will. And I believe that Jesus came and he died so that I might have life. And I'm trusting in him for that. And then I'm, I'm repenting toward him. I used to think it was just about me, but now I know it's you and your plan, and I want to be involved in a part of that. Please come rescue me. Sin separates humans from God and creates a need for reconciliation. The Old Testament, animal sacrifices were offered as a temporary atonement for sins. Atonement is this idea of making amends, reparation, or satisfaction of something that's been done wrong and we owe Jesus Christ the Son of God is believed to be the ultimate sacrifice and atonement for sin through his death on the cross Jesus took that punishment on himself when we accept Jesus' sacrifices we are forgiven we are reconciled to God created in his image sin rips us apart by the blood of Jesus Christ we can have that healing and being brought back into our relationship with our Creator when we accept that, when we embrace that, an atonement is what bridges that gap. When you think of the wrath of God against sin and the wrath that we deserve, I think of the cross. And you know those little litmus tests where you can put them in that water and then it soaks up? It starts to soak up that little bitty stick. If you ever did a COVID test at all in the last several years, you know what I'm talking about. And you put that thing in the water, and then it starts to kind of go up. When I think about the cross, and I think about reconciliation, God's wrath against sin, and it's soaking up right through Jesus. And then the sin and the wrath that I deserve, I can just see the love of Jesus is coming towards me. And that is that atonement, that covering, that connector, taking what we deserve what we should have and connecting it to the mercy and the grace of God in Christ Jesus and reconciling and bringing those things together. This is why if you're, a, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus always has to be at the center because it always brings us back to that point of like our dependence and our need that he's the king of kings, he's the Lord of lords, he's the name that is above every name and we do not want to move past Jesus. We want to continue to cling to him and abide in him and to go to him as the central focus because that's when we remember where we were. We know what we deserved, but we're also resting in God's grace and his mercy at the cross of Christ Jesus. And he didn't just lay his life down, but he took it up again, and we can still see him face to face. Atonement is a gift of grace from God. It's something that the resurrected Jesus demonstrates, and we can trust him. And atonement really is the central tenet of Christianity, providing salvation and eternal life. The atonement matters. The sacrificial atonement of Jesus Christ is the crux of human history so that we can be made at one with God. We can be reconciled back in to that relationship. I want to show you a visual illustration and then we'll have a time of response because you today might need to say, I need that atonement. I need to be covered. I need to come underneath that. I need to trust in him. I need my sins to be covered. And we all do. And in Christ, that is the promise. That is the hope. That is the gift that we have. All right, Edson, come up here with me, buddy. I asked Edson's parents if he could help me today. He said, they said yes. You said yes. And I said, tell them it's only going to hurt a little. Um, so you come stand right there and just look handsome. You said you could do that. Edson is, uh, is my volunteer here. So let's just, let's just consider Edson created in the image of God. Do you know how to put a shirt on? Okay, good. It's just going to get super awkward if you couldn't. There you go. They're clapping for you. They used to do that when you were a baby. 
you would like do something simply, simple and productive, and then everybody was all excited, okay? We're, we're still cheering you on. So let's just say that, that Edson is representative of humanity. Adam and Eve before the fall, uh, clean before God. In that relationship, no sin in the way. Uh, and then, oh yeah, I forgot one of the things that's going to be super important. We're going to need this. That's probably, just, yeah, probably you want to cover your shoes. Just keep looking that way, you'll be totally fine. You can trust me, I'm a preacher. <laughs> that laugh is cynicism, okay? So let's just say that, that this represents humanity before the fall. Then Genesis chapter 3, do you know what happens? Yeah, it does. It does. So what ends up happening um, is sin, sin enters in. It's okay, it's Joshua shirt. Sin, sin enters in, and guess what? Adam and Eve, they decide, hey, let's cover it up. Try to get, go ahead and get that mud off for me. Um, they try, and they're, they're not pulling it off. And so, okay, yeah, you're making it worse. Good human, good human. So Adam and Eve, they try to cover it up, and then uh, the Old Testament actually says that our best works are like filthy rags. No matter how hard we try, it just gets worse and worse. Now just multiply this over and over again. I'm going to spare you more mud um, because we're just going to do that, okay? This idea that before God, we stand before him a mess. And God is holy. He's clean. He's pure. And so we can't, we can't be with him because of that. And there's nothing that we can do to clean it up. We are where we are. We're stuck in the muddy, miry clay. We're in a pit. And so God provides. God provides by the way of atonement. Jesus. And he comes for humanity. And by his blood. Nick, not that helpful for the illustration. The idea is, is that Christ's blood covers us. It's not that, you can clap that up. It's not that sin never happened. It's that in Christ, it's as if it never happened. That Christ's blood covers it. So that when Edson or myself even though we're created in the image of God and we inherit a muddy shirt and we just make it worse, that in Jesus that sin is covered and we are in a relationship with God again. And yes, there's going to be more mud flying around, but that's where 1 John is so important. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we can continue to walk in that relationship with Jesus Christ. So what we don't need is us pretending we don't have sin or a need. It's understanding that because of our sin, we have such a deep need. And Jesus paid it in full already. And so this morning, perhaps for you, you come in with a, with a muddy soul. And Jesus says, come to me, I've got you covered. Come and trust me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the realization that in the atonement we have something that is difficult to think about it's difficult to understand but when it comes together in Jesus Christ we understand that we are spiritually dirty before you and you love us anyway and you come alongside us you send your very own son to live a sinless life his shirt stayed clean the whole time and then he took that clean shirt and he shed his blood on the cross and rather than that shirt being covered in mud it was covered in blood and we can have life and life everlasting our sins can be forgiven as if we had never sinned before you and we can learn to walk with jesus and to help others that are in a mess so that they too can have their sins covered so they can be reunited and reconciled with their creator so that we can learn what it looks like to walk as image bearers, to follow after Jesus, to be in 
and experiencing relationship of hope and healing, to learn to be faithful in the ordinary and to see you do the extraordinary. Father, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that this is a moment for them where they're saying, I'm, I need that covering. I'm, I need Jesus. Father, that you'd give them the courage and the conviction to be able to come and talk to myself or Lucas and just say, I need Jesus. Would you help lead me to him? For others of us that maybe we just feel like we've forgotten this and we need to be reminded this morning that you stir that up through the work of the Spirit that we might be walking in a healthy relationship with you. Father, we give you these next few moments. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing.